Welcome to the ancient woodland of Glenmore Forest in the Scottish Highlands. I've been here for the last three weeks reading and thinking about who am I? It's really easy for us to fall into this idea that we are a consciousness trapped in a bag of skin, alone and alienated in a difficult world with our respective flaws and failings. At least the story about who I am and how I messed up in certain ways has been the source of most, if not all, of my mental pain. I don't know if that's familiar. But this idea of I, of you, this conception of our being, is it correct? Who are we? Are we our body? Are we our mind? Are we our consciousness? Well, I've been going for long walks and cycles in nature, talking to the trees, they're hundreds of years old, and reading philosophy. And I feel like I do have a bit of a better idea of my place in the universe. So in this video, I'd like to explore some of the lessons that I've learned, because it might help you on your journey. I'm guessing I'm not the only one who feels good walking in nature, that's probably stating the bleeding obvious, but perhaps we feel good because we're subconsciously reconnecting with part of us. Hear me out. Cut off my leg, I bleed out. Take my heart out, George is no more, but curiously, get rid of that and we won't be about either. For most of Earth's history, the atmosphere was made up mainly of hydrogen, an explosive toxic gas that prevented life on Earth for billions of years. But thankfully, over hundreds of millions of years, plants in the ocean released oxygen. Indeed, 99% of our atmosphere today is of biological origin. And of course, that continues with trees like this, which release oxygen as a consequence of photosynthesis, which we then inhale. We exhale carbon dioxide, which it then uses in turn. It's a beautiful symbiotic relationship. So the next time you go for a walk, consider the trees as your second pair of lungs. This leads us to the surprising conclusion that the trees surely are just as an inseparable part of who we are as our lungs and hearts. We wouldn't survive without them. Suddenly the definition of our being has transcended the borders of our skin to something much larger, something much more interesting. Where then do we begin and end? Well, perhaps that's the wrong question because like the relationship between humans and the trees, there's an inseparable dependence between you and I in almost every aspect of the planet, the solar system, the galaxy and the universe. That's why Carl Sagan famously said, if you want to make an apple pie from scratch, you better start at the Big Bang. Carl Sagan's a legend. <laughs> what a quote. And check out this quote as well. If you want life, you need heavy elements. To make heavy elements out of hydrogen, you need thermonuclear combustion. To have thermonuclear combustion, you need a time of cooking in a star of several billion years. In order to stretch out several billion years in its time dimension, the universe, according to general relativity, must be several billion years across in its space dimension. So the universe's bigness is a necessary condition of our hereness. So next time you look at the night sky, you shouldn't think, oh, why am I so small and the universe so big? It's exactly the perfect size for you to enjoy and have wonder looking at the night sky. You and I are intimately wrapped up in the whole cosmos. In the words of Alan Watts, each individual is a unique expression of the total realm of nature. You are dependent upon and therefore arise with, come into being with everything else. You can't be separated. Now that is a cool idea and surely is a ground for feeling a belonging to this world rather than being an alien visitor. You and I are deeply connected. So the next time you're feeling down, consider going for a walk and remember that your true being is much larger, much more powerful and mysterious than you'd normally ever give yourself credit for. All right, let's go for a ride. But what about our consciousness? Because you do seem to have a different point of consciousness to me. I can't see what you see, I can't feel what you feel, I can't hear your thoughts. And of course, this is how a different identity evolves in each of us. We grow up in our thoughts and string them together with memory to create a story of who we are. So yeah, maybe we can believe that our physical body is intimately connected to everything else, but surely our formless mental selves are these stories. Like I'm George and my favorite biscuit is chocolatey rounds. I recommend it if you haven't tried it before. Uh, I'm mentally weak, which is why I procrastinate and get anxious. So I need to improve myself. At least that was the story that I had before reading all this philosophy stuff. And it gave me a lot of pain. It gave me anxiety. And, and I imagine that you probably have something similar. 
But of course the problem with these stories is that they change a lot. Say you're going out for a night out, you're wearing your best outfit, you check yourself in the mirror, you're looking good. Then you have a quick scroll on Instagram and check out the fitness babes and suddenly you think, oh actually I'm not as good as I once thought I was. You're exactly the same person, exactly the same being, only moments apart. And yet that story is completely different. You feel completely different. So there's no way that that ego story could be us because it changes too much. It changes depending on the weather, who you meet, what job you have. So that can't be fundamentally who we are. So if we're not the ego story, then who are we? So this is where things get interesting and at least it's a key insight for me on this trip. If you've done a bit of meditation, you'll know about the concept of the observer. We can try and demonstrate it now. So if you just think about the word jellyfish, just say jellyfish in your head. Can you hear it? So when your mind is thinking the word jellyfish, who's observing your mind do the thinking? It's spooky, right? And when you try and meditate and you catch yourself worrying about the clothes that you left in the washing machine, who's watching your mind worry about smelly clothes? It's your mind watching your mind. And in Zen Buddhism, they distinguish between the thinking mind and the observing mind. The existence of the observer is one of the key insights that you get from meditation. You realize, wait a sec, I don't need to be controlled by every thought. I can observe them. You can have a negative thought pop up and go without it affecting how you feel. That's the key insight that's helped me and millions of others liberate ourselves at least a bit from a lot of our mental pain. But the existence of the observer is more significant than that. Because truly, who we are, our formless, mental, non-physical essence is just that observer. It's the point of conscious awareness that we all have. Think about it. What else is with us from birth to death, through every job that we have, through every person that we meet, through every thought that we use to construct the story of who we are? Behind all of that is the observer, that point of awareness. And we can connect with that kind of pure, unlabeled, undefined essence in moments of quiet. In fact, in the forest, I've had some crazy experiences here where I lost the sense of my body. There was no George left, no breath, no thought. All that was left of me was just a point of awareness, like a droplet of water hanging off the moss. You know, I've read about experiences like that and the spirituals always say, look, the answer's not in the book. You've just got to experience it for yourself. And I'm such a sucker for thinking that I could think through and read through everything. But truly, when you experience it, you realize, wait a sec, yeah, really all that is left of me is not the ego of George. It is just that point of awareness. And you know, I'm quite glad, at least in my current understanding, that I have an ego, an idea of who I am, where I've been, where I'm going. Without that, I'd just be a point of awareness lost at sea. But surely, the stories of who we are are constructed. Maybe let's just have a moment of quiet together now. Let's just take a breath in and, and observe it. So just take a breath in. In this moment, we could be anyone or no one. The ideas of beautiful, ugly, uh, good, bad, smart, stupid, interesting, boring, None of those apply to that present moment. We, we, we are labelless, we are formless in that moment of presence. We're just a piece of conscious awareness in the world. So what's the significance of this? Well, it seems to me that the craziest, most bonkers part of existence is the very fact that we all have a unique bit of consciousness. Our atoms were made in a distant star billions of years ago and these, this stardust and your stardust has woken up it's awake. In all our searching of the cosmos, we haven't found a single other species that is self-aware like we are. So the next time you're feeling down about who you are, about your ego story, you can remind yourself of the story of your essence, that you are stardust that woke up. And that reminds you that anything that you believe about yourself on top of that is up to you. And that can free us from so much stress and pain in our lives. So bringing these ideas together, and of course these aren't my ideas, they're my current understanding of Zen Buddhism, Taoism, Christian mysticism. All the spiritual traditions seem to point to the same thing, that who we really are, our true being is inseparable from the whole, with a unique point of conscious awareness. 
you and I are like waves on the ocean, distinct, but very much connected. And the more time I spend in nature, the more ridiculous an idea it seems to be able to criticize who I am. I know self-love is truly a difficult thing. Every day there's something I don't like about myself or something I want to improve, and I imagine you're probably the same. But to criticize ourselves is to miss the point. We're stardust that woke up, true miracles, and we can celebrate that. So the next time that you notice those harsh thoughts, remind yourself of your true being, your true wonder, your true mystery. And hopefully those thoughts will have just a bit less power. Yeah, so thanks for watching. It's been three weeks of trying to think through these ideas and it was great to finally have a bit of insight in the forest. So I'd love to hear your thoughts on it. The next video that you'll see will be down in London. I've only got a week left here. I'm going to the Extinction Rebellion climate change protests in London. We're shutting down Westminster. It's going to be the UK's biggest civil disobedience event ever. It's going to be pretty crazy. Uh, you'll see the star video eventually. I think I might actually come back up here in the winter because I haven't quite finished uh, the sort of shots that I want to get. Um, but yeah, hope you're doing well. Thanks for watching. See you next time.